Hi, everyone. Welcome to the channel. My name is Nick Cosgrove, and I'm back with this week's No Filter Q&A. This is the episode where I answer all questions related to diet, training, and supplementation I've received over the last seven days from our in-house clients, online clients, as well as a few of our online followers. Remember, if you have any questions related to your nutritional plan, workout program, supplements you are currently taking, not taking, or considering taking, please feel free to email me those questions at nick at foreverfitperformance.com, or you can DM me your questions on my Instagram at fitcosgrove underscore. All right, let's get started with this week's no filter Q&A with question number one. Nick, what should my current daily cal caloric intake be if I'm trying to add on about 20 pounds of muscle before next summer? I currently weigh 192 pounds. Um, okay, so for those that don't know, I actually don't count calories when it comes to building uh, muscle and losing fat. I've never been a firm believer that calories really matter, okay? Um, I'm a firm believer in focusing more on the macronutrient component, okay? And not just the macronutrient component, but the micronutrient component, the quality of the macronutrients, the complex carbohydrates, the healthy fats, and lean protein sources that you're consuming, Okay. Um, now, the reason I don't count calories is because to me, calories are irrelevant when the goal is to lose body fat and build muscle. If the goal is simply just to lose weight on the scale, by all means, count calories. It'll work. Yeah. If you go into a caloric deficit, you'll lose weight. If you go into a caloric surplus, you'll gain weight. Yeah. It's just simple math for sure. But here's the thing. Building muscle and losing fat is a little bit more challenging and you have, therefore you have to be a little bit more strategic with how you implement a nutritional plan that correlates well with your training program. Okay. So I can't give you an answer for how many calories that you should be consuming at 192 pounds. Of course, if you were to do a simple Google search, they'll probably tell you to go to about maybe 3000 calories a day based on that amount of weight. But I disagree with that. Okay. I think what you should be more focusing on is saying off with a basic six meal template, and evening out your proteins, your fats, and your carbohydrates throughout each meal of the day, okay? Um, and then you have that basic template to follow. And then when it stops working for you, as in when you stop adding on weight on the scale or your weights in the gym are not going up anymore, or you're not seeing progress with your physique, that's when you need to start increasing your overall macronutrient consumption. Now, which macronutrients should you increase? Well, that's going to depend on where you are at with your goals and where you are at with your training. Sometimes it's your carbs, sometimes it's your fats, sometimes it's your proteins. This is why I'm also a firm believer in rotating your macronutrients on a weekly basis. So anyone that works with me on their nutritional plans will tell you that I always rotate macronutrients on a weekly basis when they send me their weekly check-ins. So if someone sends me their check-ins and everything is looking good, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to leave it alone. But I might just say, you know what, Today, we're going to actually, for this next week, I'm going to lower your fats, increase your carbs, and rotate your proteins. Uh, and then the next week, I might increase the protein, decrease the carbs, and increase the fats, whatever works for the person I'm working with, okay? So th that it really comes down to the macronutrient component, and that's so important, okay? So really, if your goal is to build muscle, you have to stop counting calories, okay? It's about the quality of the nutrients that you're consuming, the frequency, the sequency, and most importantly, the consistency, okay? Because that's one thing I see a lot of people screw up on is that they're not consistent. They get two or three days on the diet plan and then they shit the bed for day four. And we start all over again. I'm like, no, no, I need this day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out. And little changes create big changes, okay? So I can't give you a definitive answer on 192 pounds, how many calories you should be consuming. My recommendation though, would be to spread out your carbs, fats, proteins to six meals throughout the day to start as a basic template. Um, and then based on what you're doing activity wise, how much muscle you have in comparison to fat, that's how you're going to plug in how many carbs, proteins, and fats you should start with. Okay. If you're not sure how to do that, you definitely shouldn't hire a knowledgeable and experienced coach that can help you, uh, can make a world of difference. So you're not making any mistakes and you're not wasting your time. Okay. If you need help with a nutritional plan or training program, you can always DM me on my Instagram, fitcosgrove underscore, or reach out to me, email nick at foreverfitperformance.com. I work with people all the time, both in-house and online. All right, next question. Uh, nick, how do I know if I'm getting enough protein in my diet to support muscle growth? You know, in my opinion, protein is the most overrated macronutrient. Everyone thinks you need to consume so much protein to gain muscle, and it's not true. I mean, yes, you definitely need to consume protein to gain muscle, but you don't need to consume large amounts, like ridiculously large amounts to gain muscle, okay? So what I usually do with people when I'm working with them in the, uh, whether I'm working with them online or in the gym, I'll look at their body weight and say someone weighs 200 pounds and I'll go, okay, you know what? I'm gonna start them on 
one gram of protein per body weight. So that person who's 200 pounds, and this is not just a combination of, it could be a combination of muscle and fat. There's 200 pounds. I'm going to start them off with 200 grams of protein. And then I'm going to make revisions based on how their body responds to that after one week, two weeks, three weeks. Okay. Uh, some people I'll go up, some people I'll go down. Okay. So again, it really depends on the individual I'm working with. Um, you know, if you go online and they'll give you a generic formula, you should times your body weight by 1.5, but I don't like doing that because I find that first of all, if you're looking at someone, they're going to have fat and muscle, even people who are lean like myself, I still carry fat. So I don't, I like to try my best to focus on the lean muscle mass. And that's why I say, you know what, whatever your weight is, I'm just going to times it by one to start. And that way I'm kind of getting close enough to what your lean uh, muscle mass is. Okay. As opposed to just times it by 1.5. And that would, in my opinion, would be too much for someone who maybe is 200 pounds, but has that 18% body fat, right? So if I'm working with someone who's 200 pounds and they're at 18% body fat and I give them 200 grams of protein, that's going to be about right based on what their lean muscle mass is. Cause their lean muscle mass is not 200 pounds. It might be 130 pounds, right? And then they're carrying 60 pounds of fat or they're carrying 40 pounds of fat, whatever that is, right? And of course there's water weight as well to take into consideration. So that's what I recommend to start off with. Uh, even for myself, when I used to uh, prep for shows towards the end, when I would train myself for shows, I would always start off, okay, I'm starting my diet. I'm at 198 pounds. So I'm going to start with 100, 198 grams of protein. And then I would make revisions along the way. As I got closer to the show, I usually would decrease my protein, not increase my protein. I decrease my protein because my weight's going down the scale. Okay. I don't need all that protein and I wouldn't lose muscle. <laughs> I would never lose muscle. So protein, again, it's necessary. Yes, but not in ridiculously large quantities. You don't need to. Um, I generally recommend for people, uh, you know, for like an active male, not to consume more than 40 grams of protein per meal. And for an active female, not to consume more than 25 to 30 grams per meal. Okay. If you're doing a five to six meal plan, because really you're wasting protein. If you start consuming these like hundred grams of protein or per meal. Okay. Cause it's just going to get wasted. It's going to get stored as body fat. So you don't need it. Okay. So don't overdo it on the protein. Focus more on the healthy fats and the complex carbs. Cause in my opinion, those are just as crucial, especially the healthy fats, healthy fats. I should do a whole other episode on this, but healthy fats, in my opinion, are actually the most underrated macronutrient. And one that I tended to neglect in my younger years, because I didn't really know anything about dietary nutrition. But once I started incorporating more healthy fats into my diet, my physique changed dramatically. So healthy fats make a huge difference in the transformation of your physique, how you look, how you feel and how you perform in the gym. So protein, most overrated macronutrient and healthy fats, the most underrated macronutrient. Complex carbohydrates, the most misunderstood macronutrient. All right, next question. Uh, oh, healthy fat question. <laughs> okay. Uh, Nick, what are the best sources of healthy fats and complex carbohydrates to use for building muscle? Uh, good question. You know, and there's a lot of healthy fats out there and there's a lot of complex carbohydrates out there. What you need to do though is find out which ones that you enjoy. Because if you don't enjoy it, chances are you're probably not going to stick with it. So I could list off healthy fats being like extra virgin olive oil, macadamia nut oil, omega-3 eggs, avocado, salmon, right? Um, you know, all these healthy fats, I can recommend natural peanut butter, almond butter, cashew butter, but you have to find out which healthy fats work well for you, right? I have some people that don't like nut butters, but they like nuts. So they'll do almonds and walnuts. I have some people who are allergic to nuts, so they can't do nuts at all. But in those cases, I'll have someone do uh, maybe extra salmon, right? Or I'll have them do omega-3 eggs or I'll have them do extra avocado. So you have to find out which fats work well with your body. Same thing with complex carbohydrates. I can list a whole bunch of complex carbohydrates, quinoa, yam, sweet potato, brown rice, oatmeal, cream of rice, the list goes on and on, but you need to figure out which complex carbohydrates that your body doesn't necessarily um, reject, but also that you enjoy. Okay, because sometimes there's certain foods that people can't tolerate. I have clients that work with me that can't tolerate oatmeal. It's just, even if they're having gluten-free oatmeal, they just can't stomach it. And that's fine. Same thing with quinoa. I have a lot of people that can't stomach quinoa. So quinoa, even though it's considered to be a superfood, it doesn't work for the, someone. And therefore, they're going to switch over to something like brown rice, yams, sweet potatoes, right? Those work great. Okay, Ezekiel bread, carbonyl bread. So you have to figure out which complex carbohydrates work well for you. You notice that I left pasta off that list. As I mentioned in the past, I don't like to include pasta on my nutritional plans. 
Um, I do find that it's very, A, calorically dense and very, very high in carbs. Um, and, you know, sometimes people will say, well, it's only like 20 grams of carbs per serving. I'm like, yeah, but you're not having that serving. You're having, I talked about this last week on the channel, you're having like three or four of those servings. So pasta is one of those carbohydrates I wouldn't recommend. I'd save it for a cheat meal, but it's complex carbs, healthy fats, you just have to figure out which ones work best with your body type, okay? Um, and when I work with people on their nutritional plans, I always give them tons of choices. And I always tell them they can mix and match. You know, if they feel like having quinoa one day and brown rice the next day, yams one day, sweet potatoes one day, cream of rice, whatever, they can do whatever they want as long as they're getting in that 30 or 40 grams of carbohydrates, whatever is the quality, the quantity I give them for that week. All right, next question. Nick, do you recommend balancing your macronutrients effectively for muscle gain and fat loss throughout the day? Um, I don't really understand that question. Sorry. Um, let me read that one more time. Balancing your macronutrients effectively for okay. How do I recommend balancing your macronutrients effectively for muscle gain and for fat loss throughout the day? That's a good question. Um, okay, so this really depends on, again, your lifestyle. And what I mean by that is if you're, you're say someone you wake up at like 5 a.m. like I do, right? You chances are you're not super hungry in the morning. I'm never that hungry in the morning. So you might want to have something small. Uh, you know, for me, I'll have like half a cup of oats and I'll throw in a scoop of protein powder. I won't throw any fats into my, my morning uh, meal. Okay, that works for me. And then I'll usually go to the gym, train a few clients, have a few meetings, and then I'll have another meal. In that meal, I'll typically do another protein and carbohydrate meal. Now, again, no fats. And the reason why is that's usually considered my pre-workout meal. And as I've talked about in the past, I don't recommend consuming fats pre-workout because fats take longer for the body to digest. So the last thing you want is while you're working on the gym for your body to be digesting food. So you want something that's very easy to digest. So I recommend a complex carbohydrate source, something like uh, brown rice and a lean protein source, maybe some lean ground chicken breasts or lean ground turkey breasts or you know, anything lean, cod, uh, egg whites, uh, something that's easy for the body to digest. And then for me, my third meal, my post-workout meal would consist of protein, complex carbohydrates, and fats. So for my lifestyle, what I typically do is I front load carbs at the beginning of the day. And as the day goes on, I start to lower my carbs and increase my fats. That's what works for my lifestyle and my training schedule and my work schedule. But if I'm working with someone else who's on a completely different schedule, let's say they work nights, I might change that all over again. Okay. Um, but the most important thing is the meals that surround your workouts. So your pre-workout and your post-workout nutrition. And so that's the one thing I always try to really uh, hit home to clients and say, okay, well, I don't care where you put your meals throughout the day. You got to figure out, I gave you six meals. You can implement those meals wherever you want. But the only thing I will tell them is that for your pre-workout meal, just make sure that it's a non-fat meal. And I have different meals that have different carbohydrates, different fats. Some have no fats, some have no protein, some have no carbs, depending on what we're doing. I don't always space out fats, carbs, protein for every single meal. Okay. Um, that's another misconception that a lot of people think I do. And no, there's some meals where I'll have a very low fat meal. And there's another meal where I'll have a very high fat meal, no carb diet or meal, sorry. And I'll have a high carb uh, meal and a very low fat meal right? Protein remains relatively consistent. So I shouldn't say no protein, but some meals will go lower on. So to answer that question, it really depends on your lifestyle. But at the end of the day, let's say your macronutrient allowance, your daily macronutrient allowance is 200 grams of protein, 300 grams of carbs, so let's say 100 grams of fat. As long as you're getting all those macros in within a 24-hour period, you're good. How you put those in, that will come down to, like I said, your lifestyle, your training schedule. But as long as they're all in, you're going to put on muscle and you're going to lose fat. As long as you're putting in the, the right calculations, <laughs> right? So that's, again, will come down to figuring out how many macronutrients you need for each meal, how many daily macronutrients you need, complex carbs, healthy fats, proteins, based on your activity level, how much weight you need to lose, how much weight you can gain, whatever your goal is, okay? So to answer that question one more time, it's not necessarily balancing out carbs, fats, protein for every single meal. It really comes down to strategizing, just like you would in the gym, strategizing your workout, strategize your nutritional plan, okay? So the two can correlate together, which is gonna produce optimal results with not just your health and fitness, but your overall physique as well. All right, next question. Nick, what type of workout routine should I follow to maximize muscle gain while losing fat? Bodybuilding. Bodybuilding works. Bodybuilding training split. 
In my experience of doing this now for 22 plus years, the people that put on muscle and lose fat are people who are following bodybuilding splits, period. Okay. Yes. I mentioned this last week. You will put on muscle if you're doing CrossFit. Okay. You will put on some muscle if you're doing powerlifting. You will lose fat if you're doing Orange Theory. Sure. Okay. But we know bodybuilding splits work time and time again. And not only are bodybuilding splits an effective way to build muscle and lose fat, they're a safe way to do it. There's no ridiculous ballistic exercises like you see in CrossFit. You're not running on a treadmill for 20 minutes like you see in Orange Theory. You know, there's none of these like ridiculous one rep maxes that you see in powerlifting. So bodybuilding works. So when someone asks me this question, I say bodybuilding. Okay. It works. Bodybuilding is all about building your physique. Okay. Yes, there's definitely some health components that come along with that, right? Improved cardiovascular endurance being one of them, right? Because you're training with high intense volume. Well, you should be training with high intense volume, you know, doing lots of reps, lots of sets, minimal rest periods. So you are working your cardiovascular system while at the same time, you're working your muscular system. So it's a two in one. Okay. These powerlifting competitions where you see people doing one to three reps or meets that you're not working your cardiovascular endurance, right? And when you see Orange Theory and you see people running on treadmills, well, sure, but you're not really lifting heavy weights. So you're not really building your muscular system. So bodybuilding works, okay? And yeah, I might be a little bit biased because I've been bodybuilding for 20 plus years, but time and time again, I've used this same strategy with people, just normal people who want to be fit. And I put them on a bodybuilding split and they're like, wow, this is working. And it works because it's safe and it's an effective way to train, okay? You have different muscle groups that you can train. Day one, you could do, I've talked about this before. If you were doing, let's say a five, six day split, day one, you could do chest. Day two, you could do back. Day three, you could do shoulders. Day four, you could do arms. Day five, you could do legs. Day six, you could do cardio. You know, or you could take the, the two days off and do a five day split. So it's a great way to train because you're not going to overtrain your muscular system. You're not going to overtrain your central nervous system. So bodybuilding splits work, especially when it comes to building muscle and losing fat. All right. Uh, Nick, what exercises are most effective for each muscle group? <laughs> um, you know, again, you're going to get different answers to this question, right? But this will come down to your genetics and your structure. Uh, for example, I noticed for me, I never really responded well to, I've talked about this in the past, to deadlifts. I never found the benefits of deadlifts. Every time I did them, my lower back hurt for days. I was doing them correctly, but every time I did them, my lower back would hurt. It would affect my squats. No matter how far I tried to space out deadlifts from squats, I couldn't squat as low. My hips would be sore, so it would affect my lunges. Um, it was affecting even my curls because you need lower back strength to even do like a barbell curl or an easy bar curl. So I took them out. Um, and, you know, a lot of people will tell you, oh, you need to deadlift. But for me, it didn't ever do anything. So I always tell people, you have to assess your physique. You have to really look at your physique and say, okay, assess your strengths and assess your weaknesses. And then you go from there and you put together a plan that's going to consist of a lot of compound lifts, a lot of iso uh, isotonic lifts, a lot of isometric lifts, a lot of isolation lifts, a combination of all, right? Because I always think when you're building your physique, it's like building a house. You need to have the, um, the exercises that are going to build the muscle, right? But you also have to have the exercises that are going to define the muscle. So if you're building a house, you're going to build the house, but you also need to paint the house, right? You got to put in the little details at the end, right? So it's important to do a combination of everything, okay? Now, I don't think that there's one exercise that's best. You know, I talked about this on my Instagram the other day. I talked about how I'll actually find that walking lunges to be more effective than barbell back squats, but that might not be true for everyone, right? Some people might respond really well to barbell back squats, um, I always noticed though, when I started including more alternate lunges into my leg workouts, my legs really started to respond. So lunges worked really well for me. Okay. Um, I work with a few taller guys who are over six foot, like three, six foot four. They're pretty tall. Barbell squats are difficult for them. They don't get that full range of motion. They lack that mobility and flexibility, but they do really well when I give them, let's say like a hack squat or a ball wall squat, or if I, if I'm working with them online, I tell them I want you to do leg press. So you really have to figure out what works well for you and your height. I always recommend though, that no matter what, you always stick to at least one compound lift for every single muscle group, regardless of your genetics. So you look at the compound lifts out there. Uh, let's say we're looking at, let's say chest. Chest, you've got an incline barbell bench press or a flat barbell bench press. To me, those are two compound lifts. You don't need to do both of them, but I would at least do one of them. 
Okay. Same thing for back. You want to make sure you get at least two compound movements in there. So whether that be like a T-bar row or a bent over barbell row, those are two excellent exercises. They're two mass gain exercises. They're not done on machines. You have to bend over to do them. You have to use your stabilizers. Again, you don't have to do both, but you should be able to do one or the other, whether it's barbell rows or T-bar rows. You know, you can alternate them on a weekly basis. One week barbell rows, one week T-bar rows. Okay. Same thing with legs, compound lifts. You're going to want to do at least barbell back squats, or a good hack squat machine or leg press, something that's a heavy compound movement, okay? So as long as you have at least one compound lift for every single muscle group, you're good. But you have to decide what that compound lift's gonna be. And if you're not sure, you're gonna have to do some trial and error. How do I feel after doing a flat barbell bench press? Does my shoulder hurt? Um, how do I feel after doing deadlifts? Is like, like me, does your lower back hurt and pain? How do I feel after doing barbell back squats? Are my knees bothering me? Because just because they're considered to be the king of all exercises, when I'm talking about these three lifts, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you and your body type. Okay. That's very important to remember because if you just keep listening to people say, oh no, you have to do deadlifts, you have to do squats, you have to bench press, and you know they're not working for you and you know you're feeling injured. A small injury is going to lead to a bigger injury, okay? So that's where you have to really be honest with yourself and go, okay, what are my physical limitations and what can I do with my genetics and my fitness level and my knowledge of exercise, uh, ex exercises in the gym, okay? So that's what you should be working on, okay? So it's not that there's one exercise out there that's better than the other. It's just figuring out the formula that works best for your physique, your lifestyle, your genetics, and your goals, Okay. Oh, another uh, training uh, question. Uh, okay, Nick, should I be focusing more on compound movements or isolation exercises when I'm working out with weights? So I kind of just answered that question. Uh, getting a lot of uh, questions on training today, which is great. Uh, so again, I, I would focus on both. Okay. So as I mentioned, you want to do a combination of the two. My recommendation though, is to put the compound lifts at the beginning of your workouts and the isolation, isolation lifts at the end of your workout. So for example, if you're doing a chest workout, I do recommend doing your presses, your incline barbell press, your incline dumbbell press, your flat barbell press, or your flat dumbbell presses before you do your flies, your dumbbell flies and your cable flies. Now, if you're more advanced in your training, you can get away with doing the combination of the two, like one compound for one set and then do an isolation for another set, go back to a compound. That's what I typically do with a lot of my muscle groups. So don't forget, I've been training for over two decades. If you're someone who's fairly new to the gym, or you've only been training for a few years, play it safe. I recommend doing your compound lifts first. So your mass builders first. So as I said, if you're doing a chest workout, that's going to be your barbell presses, your dumbbell presses, and then your flies, which are your defining exercises. Remember, you're painting the house afterwards. You don't want to paint your house before you build it. If you've been training for, you know, like me for 10 plus years, sure, go ahead. You know, you want to do a combination of the two. I see nothing wrong with that. But you just want to make sure that you are warmed up properly before doing any isolation movements. Because I have seen people tear biceps, tear hamstrings by focusing on isolation movements when they're not warmed up properly and then they go too heavy. So I always like people to warm up light with compound movements like barbell back squats, um, seated rows, bent over barbell rows, you know, dumbbell shoulder press or standing uh, barbell military press, whatever that is, and then move on to another compound exercise, two or three more compound movements and then finish it up with another two or three isolation movements. That's my recommendation for people who are new to the gym or who've only been training for, you know, three or four years. Uh, but if you're more advanced, you can kind of get away with doing a combination of the two. However, I still would recommend that your first exercise be a compound movement. Okay. Um, and that's just overall for overall safety. And plus when you're doing compound, don't forget you're warming up multiple muscle groups where if you're doing an isolation exercise, you're really isolating that one specific muscle group. Like I, let's say a dumbbell preacher curl, right? That's all bicep. I mean, your shoulder is stabilizing for sure, but it's primarily bicep. Whereas if you're doing, let's say, an incline barbell bench press, well, now you're using both pec major, pec minor, anterior deltoids, rhomboid scapula to stabilize. You're even using your lumbar region and your transverse abdominals, rectus abdominals to all keep that muscle group tight, right? Your core tight. So you're using multiple muscle groups. So that's another reason why I recommend using exercises like that because you're going to warm up more muscle groups, okay? And then you're going to be really warmed up to get to those isolation exercises towards the tail end of your workout. All right. Okay. A few more questions. Uh, Nick, what metrics should I track to measure my progress? I don't have anyone that can take my body measurements, but I have a scale at my gym that I can use. 
you know, when it comes to tracking progress, I, I've talked about this in the past. I'm a little bit old school. I look at the mirror. Okay. And when it comes to my clients who work with me both in person and online, I just look at them. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? You're not losing fat and I'm doing your diet. You're not losing the weight that I want you to lose. I'm going to have to reduce your carbohydrates and I'm going to have to increase your cardio or one or the other. Okay. Um, I just go by how people are looking and that's how I can tell if they're progressing. I don't necessarily go by the amount of weight that they're lifting because my workouts change all the time. I might have someone start one leg workout off with a barbell back squat, as I mentioned, starting with a compound movement, but then I might actually finish them with a compound movement on another leg day. Okay. Cause I'll do that as well. Sometimes with people. So it's really hard to go by the number that they're lifting in the gym because if they're starting their workout off with squats, well, obviously they're going to be stronger than if they were to finish their workouts with squats. So strength is not always the best way to know if you're progressing in the gym. Uh, what I would actually look at more if you're looking at performance standard is how long it takes you to recover after each set. Okay. So if, for example, you're someone who takes two or three minutes to recover from each set, in my opinion, I would be trying to get that down to about 30 to 45 seconds, regardless of how heavy you're pushing. Um, and you know, that's going to build up your cardiovascular endurance. And that's really good for your heart. The less rest you need, the better, right? The less work your heart has to do, the better, right? So there's many ways to gauge progress. Some people use those Apple watches. I've never been a fan of those. Some people do like to use the measurements, like the, they do calipers, body fat calipers. To me, that's always been irrelevant because whether my body fat's at 12% or 8%, if it's not where I want it to be, if I don't see my abs in the mirror, I'm still not happy. <laughs> So I'm, I don't care about that. I just go, okay, am I progressing? Is my physique changing any difference? And one thing I'll tell clients is this is so important. And especially in this day and age, it's so easy to do selfies. Okay. Shirtless selfies. Okay. Or you can do them in your underwear and you don't have to put them on Instagram. Okay. You can just keep them for yourself. And so that's what I do with my clients who work with me online. They send me progress photos on a weekly and sometimes bi-weekly basis, depending on what we're training for. Okay. And I don't compare photos when one Friday to the next Friday, let's say someone's sending me their weekly check-in every Friday morning. I'll, I'll compare photos from, let's say they send me Friday, October 1st, and then I'll look at the photo they send me on Friday, October 30th. Now they've got a good four weeks in between. I can really start to see, okay, this is where I'm seeing changes. Am I not really seeing the changes I want to see? Okay, I need to either give this person more macronutrients or fewer macronutrients, or I need to rotate macronutrients more often for them, maybe on a biweekly basis. Maybe I have to give them more cardio. Maybe I have to give them less cardio, okay? So I always go by how people look, okay? And if you're not working with a coach, I still recommend people take selfies. I find that works really well. And as I said, you don't have to put them up on social media. I mean, you can if you want to, but... I always find that's a good way to judge progress because you see yourself every day. So it's really hard to be critical of yourself or sometimes you'll be overly critical of yourself because you yourself don't see the changes. Um, and that's, that's, you know, I have a lot of people I work with and sometimes they tell me like, I don't see any changes. And I'm like, really? Because if you look at your photo that you sent me one month ago to your photo today, look at the changes. And then I'll send that to them. I'll send them a comparison shot. And like, holy shit, they didn't even notice. I'm like, yeah, because you see yourself every day. Okay. So I don't like to use the scale only. The scale does help as a guide, but I'm not a huge fan of the scale because look, the scale can go up and down depending on what you eat, how you're feeling, if you're stressed, right? It can go up for multiple reasons if you're holding water. So the scale should be used as a guide, but it shouldn't be used as your number one metric to gauge your progress. I just go by the physique. Really, that's what it comes down to. Scale is a guide. I've never done body fat measurements. I mentioned that last week on the channel. I find them to be irrelevant. I don't care if your body fat's at 10%. If you're still not where you want to be and you're like, Nick, you know what? I want to lose a little bit more fat. Then we have to keep going. I don't care if you're at 10%, 8%, 12%. doesn't matter to me. I don't care if you weigh 300 pounds or 200 pounds, as long as you're happy with your physique and you're feeling good. Okay. That's what's important. Not just looking good, but feeling good. Because I have a lot of people I've worked with in the past who look amazing, but they feel like crap because they've been dieting too hard or they're overtraining their system. Okay. So you have to have two, you can't just look good and feel like shit. You want to look good and feel good. And really that's how you gauge progress, right? Because if you're not feeling good and you're not looking the way you want to look, well, you got to keep progressing. And the only way to do that is get your ass in the gym, keep training consistently and dial in your diet and make sure you're eating correctly consistently. And that's when you're going to see changes. And that's when you're going to feel changes. It all comes down to the consistency factor. All right. Okay. Two more questions. Uh, Nick, how often do you recommend reassessing your goals and progress? 
as often as you feel it's necessary. Okay. So it's always good to do your own check-in, right? Uh, even for myself, you know, I'm not training for any competitions anymore, but every once in a while I'll be like, you know, how am I doing on these workouts? Have I become stagnant, stagnant with my workouts? You know, am I constantly just lifting the same weights in the gym? Am I not really trying to increase my weights? Have I, have I not changed up my workout at all? Am, am I doing the same workout routine over and over again? And, you know, I'll look at my physique too. And so, you know, my arms could be a little bit bigger or my belly could be a little bit smaller, right? Or my legs could be a little bit more leaner. So whatever my goal is, I'm constantly looking at my physique and assessing and being very critical and saying, you know, I want to do this. I want to maybe make my back bigger, right? So now my focus is going to be on, okay, what do I need to do in my back workout? How do I, what am I going to do? Am I going to change up my back routine? Am I going to throw in more drop sets? Am I going to throw in supersets, circuits, giant sets? And, you know, I take that and I'll go, okay, this is what I'm going to do for my back day today. And I'll think about what I'm going to do and say, I'm going to try this back routine for the next four to six weeks, not just one time, four to six weeks. And then I'll reassess my physique again. Okay. Same thing with my diet. I change up my diet from time to time. I don't eat the same thing day in and day out for 20 years. If there's certain foods that I notice are starting to bother me, which does happen sometimes. Sometimes if you eat the same food day in, day out, day in, day out, you can start to develop almost like an allergy to it. It's not exactly an allergy, but it's almost like an allergy. Your body just, you know, it rejects it. You get bloating, you get an upset stomach, or you get diarrhea, gas. And you realize, you know what? I got to take this food out. It used to do me really well, but now it's causing me issues. Take it out for a few months, maybe I'll bring it back in. So it's always good to do check-ins with yourself. Um, now, everyone's different though, right? I don't check in with myself every week. I'll just every once in a while, but usually about once a month, once every two months, sometimes I'll just say, okay, what do I want to do? How do I want to move forward with my physique, my health, my fitness? Maybe my goal is going to be, again, taking my rest periods down from 45 seconds to 30 seconds and still lift the same weight I'm lifting. That's my new goal. So I'm going to try to do that for the next three months. And so I'll work on my cardiovascular endurance. Maybe my goal is going to be, I want to be able to run on a treadmill. I haven't ran in 20 years. Maybe my goal is going to be, I want to run for 30 minutes and not have any knee pain or hip pain. So I'm going to start with a speed walk and work my way up to a jog and into a run. So it's always good to just reassess what your goals are and see how your goals align with your training and your diet. Okay. Because if they don't align, you're not going to reach them. So that's why it's good to do these reassessments every once in a while. You have to be very critical of yourself. And a lot of people have a hard time doing that because they're either too critical of themselves or they're not critical enough. And that's where it does come down to working with an experienced, knowledgeable, and reputable coach that will cut the bullshit and just tell you, you're overtraining. You need to slow it down. You know, you're in the gym seven days a week and you're doing cardio for an hour a day, or you need to do more, right? A good coach will be honest with you and tell you because that's what you're paying them for. I always take the no bullshit approach with every single person I work with. You know, I don't sugarcoat it for people. Um, I tell them, I'm like, look, you told me that you want to get down to this weight. Well, we're going to have to push the cardio more, or we're going to have to drop the carbs more. Okay. But I'm not going to sugarcoat them for them and say, oh yeah, you're going to get that goal. If you're still eating like cake and candy and doing no cardio and just sitting on your ass and missing workouts. No. I'm going to be real with them and say, okay, the reason why you're not hitting your target goal is because you missed three workouts this week, or you missed three cardio sessions, or you had four cheat meals. This is why you're not making your goals. Okay. So it's good to reassess your goals and make sure that they correlate with what you're, how you're training and how you're eating both in the gym and in the kitchen. All right. Okay. Last question. Nick, how can I handle setbacks or plateaus effectively in the gym? I feel frustrated and unmotivated when I stop seeing results. Good question. So this is when it comes down to, I talked about this last week with the, if you didn't see that episode, I talked about how vanity is not a bad thing, right? If vanity gets you into the gym, if you want to transform your physique, that's great. If that's your motivating factor to get you in the gym, perfect. But the only problem with that, it's not a long-term goal. Okay, you can't be going to the gym for 20, 30 years, say vanity, vanity, I want to look bigger. No, there are going to be some times where you do stop seeing results. You stop seeing changes in your physique. That does happen, especially if you're someone who's been training for years, year in, year out, and you already have a pretty good looking physique. It's very hard to make those changes. I can make drastic changes with someone who's sitting at 40% body fat and has never lifted a weight in their life. Give me six months with that person. Let me give them my training program and my nutritional plan. I'll transform their physique. But give me someone who's been training for 20 years and who's at like 8% body fat. Give me six months with them with their diet and training. 
I'll help them make changes, but they're not going to be drastic changes because they're already, their body fat's already low and they already have a lot of lean muscle mass that they're carrying on their physique. So the more advanced you become in your training, the harder it gets to see those changes, right? It does. So what do you do? Well, this is where you need to have a long-term goal, okay? And this is what I've talked about time and time again. If vanity gets you into the gym, great. But what's your long-term goal? What's going to keep you in the gym? It's not a sustainable goal. So what I tell a lot of people is, you know, you have to find other goals. So where that goal is, hey, my workouts allow me to think more clearly. Um, so I'm more, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm more, uh, I focus more on my work, right? Um, you know, I'm more assertive. I'm more confident in my relationships. I feel better. I sleep better. I perform better both in the gym or at work, right? So you have to think these goals are big. They're helping me, right? So that's what I do, right? And I think, okay, how is how are my workouts affecting my business? Well, for me, they really help my business because whenever I work out, I have more energy. I feel better. Um, I'm able to speak more clearly. I'm able to instruct more efficiently. Um, and I'm able to actually build relationships with people because I feel more confident, especially after, like, let's say, a, a hard leg day. I'm like, man, if I can get through that leg day, I can get through anything, right? No matter what's going on in my life. Because... <laughs> If anyone trains legs, especially with me, they'll tell you it's hard, right? It's hard. I don't enjoy training legs. Nobody enjoys training legs. No one enjoys squatting down to the ground with 300 pounds on your back and praying to God that you get back up again. But once you do it time and time again, you're like, man, I can, I did that. If I do that, I can do anything. If I did that, I can build a business. If I did that, I can buy a penthouse. So, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's those goals in the gym that correlate to what you do outside the gym. And that's so important. So I always tell people, don't just think of the aesthetics. Think about how your workouts help you in the gym, help you outside the gym, I should say. Sorry. So when you do hit those plateaus and you stop seeing changes in your physique, don't just get discouraged. So you know what? Yeah, I'm not seeing changes in my physique right now. But you know, my business is really booming right now. It's doing great. I'm getting more clients, right? Or, you know, I'm making more money in some, in my, maybe the stock market, right? Or I'm building better relationships with my girlfriend or my wife or my, my husband, whoever, right? Or my kids. So, you know, you have to start having different goals. So when you stop seeing those changes or you're not seeing those changes as fast as you'd like to, them to, see, to see those changes, there's other changes going on in your life. So your life's not all about the gym. The gym is really only about 45 minutes to 60 minutes of your day. That's it, right? So you can't make the gym your whole life. You have to have other goals, okay? So for myself, like I said, my workouts allow me to focus more on my business, growing my business, growing my brand, building my relationships, um, my investments outside the gym, whether it be in real estate or whether it be in the stock market. But it's important for me to get my workout in daily, okay? Because that workout is crucial, but not it no longer is about the physique for me. It isn't. I mean, it's great that it helps build the physique and keep me in line, but it really teaches me discipline both inside the gym, but more importantly, outside the gym with how I conduct myself in business, how I conduct myself with my diet, how I conduct myself in my relationships. So that's where the goal needs to shift. Okay. That's my recommendation. If you hit a plateau anyway, this no filter Q and a will be going up on Monday, September the 30th. As a reminder, if you have any questions related to your diet plan, workout program, supplements you are currently taking, not taking, or considering taking, please feel free to email me at nick at foreverfitperformance.com, or you can DM me your questions on my Instagram at fitcausegrove underscore. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for supporting my YouTube channel, my in-house personal training business, my online personal training business. I truly do appreciate all the support. Thank you all once again, and I will see you all next week. Bye for now.